Thanks, Adela, for that kind introduction. Yeah, if you can't get enough this evening, do come along again uh, tomorrow evening, uh, almost 24 hours from now, just around the corner at Friends Meeting House. It should be really, really good. That's part of the Cambridge Festival of Ideas. So I'm going to talk for a little while about the topic I've been assigned uh, for today, and then I want to uh, engage with you in some Q&A and discussion. Uh, and then, as uh, others mentioned, there'll be a sort of break and then the second part of the evening. So the topic I was asked to speak on is the question of whether the Green Party in the wake of the election of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader. And the first thing I'd like to say in addressing this question is that, like many of you I expect, uh, I'm really delighted that Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership of the Labour Party, which was a really astonishing uh, completely unforeseen development, just shows you what strange and wonderful things are possible these days in politics. Um, coming after the Green Surge and then the SNP uh, landslide, the Corbyn victory is a huge sign of hope to us all, uh, I think. Um, and uh, further than that, I've been arguing, along with a few other people in the Green Party, including Caroline Lucas, that it really is high time now and I think we'll be talking about this later in the evening, it really is high time now that we start to think more actively and more seriously about how to work together with other people outside the Green Party who share similar values to us in important respects or with whom we can form a kind of uh, alliance of some kind or other. What Caroline and, I, Caroline and I have been suggesting is that we really need to try to think about how to game our absurd electoral system, our completely appalling, out-of-date, um, two-party politics style electoral system which elected a conservative government on just over a third of the vote, that's of course of those who actually uh, voted, never mind those who didn't or who were disenfranchised. So what Caroline and I think is that we ought to be seeking to work together where possible with people, with like-minded people in Labour, in the SNP implied, in the Lib Dems as well to ensure that there is never again a government elected on the ridiculous minority of the vote that this government was elected on, and to start to change things for the better in the world, to end the savage regime of austerity, to move towards serious action on climate, to have constitutional reform, including, of course, to change our electoral system, which is an absolutely basic uh, requirement for us to have a proper democracy in this country. So it's in the context of admiration for Jeremy Corbyn, a, a, a wonderful, authentic man who I've known a little for some years. I've been on demonstrations uh, with him uh, when he wasn't at all famous in the way that he is now. Um, and not only that, but I believe that we ought to be thinking about how to create some kind of innovative electoral <coughs> arrangement with Corbyn and with others in Labour and other parties. Uh, the great model for this, of course, uh, is what happened just over a century ago at the birth of the Labour Party, where they had an electoral pact with the Liberals as they then were, and this was absolutely crucial in the growth of, of, uh, of Labour. I could see a similar pact, not only hitting the Conservatives uh, hard, but helping us to start to grow and move forward as a party. So it's in that context that you should hear the remarks I'm about to make about my uh, concerns about uh, Corbyn uh, and Labour uh, and the very, very strong sense in which I believe that the Green Party is absolutely as vital as, as ever in the era of Corbyn and that it simply is a complete fallacy, a complete mistake to think if anyone does think that the Green Party has been somehow kind of sidelined or something by the election of Corbyn. <coughs> It is quite clear that there are people who think that. It is quite clear that there are quarters in which Corbyn's election is seen as somehow making the Green Party irrelevant. Why do people think that? Well, I think the key reason why people think that is that one key reason, there were many, but one key reason why the Green Surge happened is that people thought that the Labour Party wasn't the Labour Party anymore. People thought the Labour Party wasn't left-wing anymore, wasn't left-wing enough and people thought the Labour Party had given up on socialism, and they were right. And that's one reason why a lot of people turned to the Green Party, one reason. And 
The election of Jeremy Corbyn has, in certain crucial respects, changed that. And we should not for a moment kid ourselves that it hasn't. It's no good our saying things like, well, yeah, but you've still got this parliamentary Labour Party that's dominated by all sorts of people who don't agree with Corbyn. Of course, that's true. And the Labour Party is going to have appalling, well, civil wars, probably, uh, in the next uh, few years. Uh, and that's going to be probably pretty bad uh, for uh, the pursuit of some of the kinds of policies that, uh, that we believe in and that some of the kinds of policies that Corbyn believes in. But make, uh, make, make no mistake, it would be an absurd mistake to think that we can now say, well, yeah, but because there are still these kind of rump Labour MPs, um, then Labour isn't really still a left-wing party or a socialist party. Labour is going to have a significantly more left-wing platform than it has had for a long time at the next election. And even if it's true that some of the well, and it is true that some of the policies that Jeremy Corbyn believes in are not going to be Labour policies or are not going to be in the Labour manifesto, it just isn't credible to say, um, vote for the Green Party because Corbyn doesn't have full control of the Labour Party. It's far too kind of complicated uh, a message. We have to give up the idea, which has now become a fantasy, that we can just do again in the next few years what we did at the general election this year, which is to say, among other things, crucially, vote Green, we're more left-wing than Labour. With Corbyn's election, that ship has sailed. So what do we do instead? That's what I want to address you about. And what I want to start with is an absolutely fundamental difference between ourselves and Corbyn's Labour Party, and that is the question of economic growth. So that's the reason why I wanted to mention uh, this book that Albert kindly waved around, The Post-Growth Project by Greenhouse, which is a green think tank of which I'm the chair. We're independent of the Green Party, but many of us are in the Green Party and we're, we think ourselves, of ourselves as the Green Think Tank and have a sort of you know, very, very loose, if you will, informal association with the Green Party. And what we try to do in this book is to set out what Britain would be like in a post-growth world, uh, how we could get to such a world and why we need to get to such a world. And let's just start by taking a moment on why we need to get to such a world. I'll come back to this point. We've lost half of our wildlife in the world in the last 40 years. Half of it is gone. And that is a truly staggering and appalling fact. We are living in this country as if we have about three or four planets. Another just completely insane uh, fact, but nevertheless, it is a fact. The left-right spectrum does not address this question. Right? You can be as left-wing as you like, but as long as you're living as if you have three or four planets and destroying half the world's wildlife, you are not addressing the great issues of our time. You are not addressing the issues on which our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren great will judge us. And if we don't manage to address these issues, believe you me, they will judge us. The question of putting an end to economic growth and stopping the unbelievable despoliation of our planet is a question where only we in the Green Party are actually serious. We are the only ones saying we have to end economic growth, we have to value other things instead, we should put well-being um, first, we should put quality of life, not quantity of stuff, first. We should look after uh, our home, look after the creatures with which we share this planet, not trash them in the name of progress. And when you look at the economic policies of Corbyn and Macdonald, you find an astonishing thing. You find that one of the central claims that they're making is that in Britain we need to have faster growth, right? As I say, being left does not get you beyond growthism. On the contrary, apparently, if you look at the, con at the contemporary political landscape in Britain. Corbyn and Macdonald are trying to outbid Osborne and Cameron on the question of how fast they can grow the economy. And it's growing the economy above all which trashes our ecosystems. Now, of course, some people say, well, can't you have green growth? Um, well, we talk about why you can't in this book. But very briefly, green growth is like clean coal. Uh, it's an ad man's buzzword, not a real world uh, phenomenon. 
There is no way of our living on this planet as if we have one planet which involves continued economic growth. You can see that in all the studies and models that have been done on the question. You can also see it if you look to, to history. There just aren't any examples of people uh, continuing to grow their economies while having the kind of scale of reductions in impact in footprint that we need if we are going to achieve, for example, our climate targets, which are non-negotiable. You can't negotiate with the atmosphere. Um, and I'm stressing these economic uh, questions and their relation to ecology because, as Caroline Lucas uh, likes to put it, to judge uh, how green a party is, it's not enough to look at their environmental policies. Anyone can have nice sounding environmental policies, and most parties do. You have to look at their economic policies. Economic policy is where you can get to judge whether a party is actually serious about addressing these kinds of uh, questions. And the blunt reality is that the Green Party is, and that the Labour Party, even under Corbyn, in fact in some ways especially under Corbyn, is not. One little straw in the wind about this is that uh, I mentioned clean coal a minute ago. Jeremy Corbyn was asked uh, a month or two ago, would he favour the resumption of coal mining in South Wales? And he said, yes, he would. He said, of course, it has to be clean uh, uh, coal uh, mining. It would, it would have to be uh, burnt with, uh, with carbon capture and storage, completely unproven uh, technology, uh, reckless uh, technology. Um, Corbyn believes in clean coal because he believes in economic growth both, uh, if we are serious about being green, about being ecological, are fantasies. The real answer, of course, on the, on the clean coal thing is, even if it's possible, we now know that we have to leave four-fifths of the fossil fuels in the ground. So that means, basically, pretty much all the coal. Right? There is no sound basis for anyone who wants to be seriously green for talking about burning coal. But that's exactly uh, what Corbyn uh, has been doing. Another example would be, um, would be runways, airport runways. Um, we are seeing um, a bit of a movement, it seems to me, in the question of what runways like to be built at the moment to, uh, around London to Gatwick. Um, well, Gatwick might be a teeny, weeny, weeny bit better than Heathrow, but of course we in the Greens say, no, you runways. You cannot keep expanding air travel if you are remotely serious about stopping our devastation of our atmosphere. What do Labour uh, say about this? Well, increasingly it sounds like what they're saying is, yes, it's terrible to have a runway at Heathrow, let's have one at Gatwick instead. Uh, and among those who are saying that are London's mayoral candidate and Jeremy Corbyn. So runway is another absolutely crucial litmus test uh, issue, um, dividing the parties. And I can't stress enough how crucial this question of being serious about ending our complete fetish economic growth uh, is, and only the Greens put that front and centre. Let's think a bit more systematically about how we think of the economy and how we think of society. So the Conservatives versus Labour, we're moving now back into a sort of more classic era with Corbyn's election of Conservative versus Labour um, uh, strife, uh, where it's going to be more of a, of a question of the Conservatives being identified with the forces of capital and Labour being identified with the forces of uh, Labour. Um, uh, while, of course, both sides trying to say, in Labour's case, we're, we're the business friendly, and in the Conservatives' case, well, we're on the side of the, of the working uh, man. But it's, it's, more of a, it's going to be more of a kind of classic right versus left argument for, for the next few years. And as I've already started to suggest, right versus left just isn't good enough. If we as Greens say, um, yeah, but we're a left wing party, I mean, that may be true in some important respects. And corporations and the super rich are totally out of control in our society. That's, that's true now as it was uh, six months ago, and we have policies absolutely crucially to address that. But if we pigeonhole pigeon ourselves as primarily a left party, we are making an absolutely fundamental framing mistake now. We are basically saying, why bother to vote for us when you've got Corbyn, <laughs> right? We have to be talking about other things than right versus left. We have to be talking about green versus grey. Um, the green agenda that we have versus the, the uh, grey, colourless agenda of all the other parties. The way that the right and the left want to have an endlessly growing uh, industrial production um, economy. 
And we need to think also beyond the antithesis between capital and labour. Because while labour tries to get labour rewarded more, and the Conservatives try to get capital rewarded more, there's something that they're both missing out. We're standing on it. Right? The earth, land, the planet. This is what is missing from the economics of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party from neoclassical mainstream economics. And seen from the point of view of the earth, both of them are just two sides of the same coin, two different kind of glove puppets with the same hands up their bums. Um, right? We have a different perspective. We have somewhere else to stand. We actually are standing uh, somewhere, and we acknowledge that. Uh, and they don't. What follows from taking land seriously? So it partly is to do, obviously, with ensuring that we don't destroy our planetary home through really serious policies on climate, which I've already started to talk about. It's partly about taking nature uh, seriously, the way that we actually believe in the preservation of nature and the way that we're in love with uh, nature, the way we care about nature and care about uh, animals and not being afraid to talk about that, which for labour is really an insignificant fringe issue where what matters is how much uh, reward the working man has uh, in his uh, pay packet. Um, land also means thinking about land reform, right? Land is overwhelmingly owned by a small number of people and corporations in this country. We need to change that. And we need to institute a tax that works with regard to land so that we end the absurdities of land speculation in this country and so that we ensure that the land is used in the most efficient manner possible while preserving as much of it uh, as possible and stopping the endless expansion of cities into green belts, an issue which is very pertinent to us here in Cambridge and also in the London area and so on. So we need land value tax and we in the Greens of course are the only ones saying that we need to have land value tax. Uh, Labour are talking about some good uh, taxes they want to levy on the city and not the rich and so on, but you won't hear them talking uh, about uh, taxing uh, the, uh, the, the landowners and the land uh, speculators. It's just not central to their vision. Carl Polanyi, the great author of a great book called The Great Transformation, which I recommend to any of you wanting to get into this more deeply, suggested that what was really wrong with conventional economics was that it didn't understand the way that the factors of production, capital, labour and land, the one which is usually more or less omitted, are not real commodities. They're not really things that can be bought uh, and sold in the way that, that commodities, ordinary commodities, can be. You can get a sense of this because, you, because it becomes clear as soon as you think about it. If supply, sorry, if demand for, for labour or for land uh, goes up, Supply doesn't go up in the same way. Right? You don't suddenly have a whole new uh, labour force or a whole lot of new land uh, uh, materialise on the earth because a demand for it uh, goes up in the way that when demand for a commodity, for a product goes up, you do, you can have that. Um, land, labour and capital, we ought to think of all three of these as what Polanyi calls fictitious commodities. They're not real commodities, but they need to be protected in a way that things which are not commodities, things which are not things designed to be bought and sold, don't need to be uh, protected. So the land needs to be protected. So actually, do capital and labour. And this again is where the Labour Party, even under the genuine left-wing socialist vision of Jeremy Corbyn, is just so far away from what we actually need and from what we in the Green Party have to offer. So let's take labour, right? So what Corbyn wants to see, what Donald wants to see, they want to see labour properly uh, rewarded, uh, and that means that they're going to be arguing for a strong, high living wage. Oh, great. You know, that's exactly what we argued uh, in the Greens at the past general election. But of course, we in the Greens actually have a, a better, stronger, very different longer-term aspiration, and that is to bring in a citizen's income. What a citizen's income is, is an unconditional basic income that goes to everybody, no matter whether they work or not. Because we don't believe that labour is this thing that needs to be bought and sold and needs to be rewarded properly as it's bought and sold. Right? We think that labour, labour power, what that really is, it's people. Right? It's us. Right? And really, it's not the kind of thing that should be bought or sold at all in an ideal society. Okay, in the less than ideal society that we live in, let's make wage labour less central 
and allow people to live whether or not uh, they labour. Well, that's what a citizen's income makes possible. It also makes possible, more broadly, the leisure society. It ends the poverty trap, the benefits trap, the unemployment trap, and it helps the precariat. It helps those who are not really helped by the living wage because they never know whether they're going to be in work or not. And there are so many of those people in our society today. Labour Party policy is basically designed for a society where there is or should be full employment and extremely powerful trade unions. We no longer live in such a society. You can fantasise saying, well, let's get back to a society like that. It's a fantasy. It's not going to happen. We need to move forward to a better vision of a world where labour is a less central feature of that world. And where corporations can't rely on having a wage slaves, however well rewarded, however high their living wages, because people can say back to them, well, actually, I've got my citizen's income, so unless you pay me what I uh, think I'm worth, I'm not going to work for you. What the citizen's income also makes possible, of course, is for people to get by being paid much lower wages than the living wage, because they already basically have enough to live on. How does this help? Well, it helps people to be able to do things like uh, volunteer uh, or to take up ethical professions. There are so many ways in which citizens' income could be a hugely transformative policy uh, for society. It's absolutely nowhere on, on Labour's agenda. What they're going to be looking to do is ramp up the living wage more and more. And that is not the direction we need to be going in as a society. And we as Greens have a far more serious offer. And finally, capital. Money making money. What's the green view of, uh, of this? Well, again, it's more radical. Again, we say money isn't a, a commodity. Money is something which society creates in order to make its wheels go round. Yeah? Money, the power to create money ought not to be in the hands of private banks. It ought to be in the hands of the people. And that's why we believe in local currencies. But it's also why we believe that money itself the power to bring money ought to be taken away from banks and ought to be owned by uh, the state on behalf of, uh, of the people. Um, we believe, in other words, in monetary reform, an end to, uh, to debt-based money, which of course, debt-based money has all sorts of other downsides, including producing an endless uh, growth imperative, taking us back to where we were 10 or 15 minutes ago in the discussion. So on these three crucial factors of production, the most crucial of all of which, land, the earth itself, is simply neglected by mainstream economics and neglected by Labour and Conservatives. And all three of which should be understood not as commodities, but as fictitious commodities, as things that need to be uh, protected and, uh, and managed for the common good. On these three crucial dimensions, land, labour and capital, we in, we in the Greens differ fundamentally from labour, including fundamentally from Corbyn's labour. And we don't, I put it to you, we don't exist primarily as a left-wing vehicle. We are primarily a green uh, vehicle. We are primarily a collective uh, enterprise um, which is based in uh, uh, our existence on a globe, but also in localities. Another dimension in which we tend to differ from Labour is the way we take more seriously localism, local democracy, and in which we're more thoroughly anti-authoritarian and democratic in our methods. None of these are captured by the crude left-right dichotomy, which is designed to apply to a, to a world which is basically gone of a kind of struggle between capital uh, and labour. That struggle still exists, and as I've said, um, there are important respects, of course, in which, otherwise I wouldn't have started out by celebrating Corbyn. There are very important respects in which we agree uh, with Labour, especially uh, when it's led by uh, a man like uh, Corbyn, in terms of clamping down on tax avoidance, in terms of ensuring that, uh, that workers are not uh, treated ruthlessly by their employers, and so on and so forth, in terms of stopping um, savage uh, uh, cuts to the, to the welfare state. But in terms of these fundamentals that I've been sketching for the last 10 or 15 minutes, we are not placed on the left-right spectrum. And to think that the left-right spectrum captures politics is to think in a way which is completely inadequate to the real challenges of the 21st century. The Green Party is designed to face those challenges. The Labour Party is not. And in some ways, uh, corbyn led Labour is actually more backward-looking even than Labour has been in recent years. However, welcome, as I've already said, it is absolutely clear that Corbyn, as compared to Miller Band, let alone Brown or Blair, um, is. 
So let me move towards a conclusion, and I, I really want to see what you think, and we'll engage in a, in a discussion uh, about this. I think that, as I said, there is room for, for believing that we can think together and to some extent work together with people like Jeremy Corbyn. I would like to see a government elected after the next election which has Corbyn uh, probably leading it as Prime Minister um, as part of the head of a rainbow progressive alliance coalition of uh, five or more uh, parties. Uh, to be a great reforming government which would bring in serious constitutional changes and electoral reform, the other things I mentioned earlier. What I would also like to see, though, is firstly, as part of that as a sine qua non, the Greens being taken seriously and us expanding our numbers of seats and no ludicrous expectation that we're just going to stand aside everywhere to enable Labour to be elected as if all that matters was the struggle to elect uh, the left. And secondly, and even more importantly, I want to see the Green Party continuing to grow and continuing to shift the political agenda in our direction, in the direction of being green, in the direction of being ecological, in the direction of being founded on an ideology of ecologism, which is the ideology of the future, and not just um, socialism. And that, for the reasons I sketched at the start, that is what we need, that is what this planet needs. If we fantasise for a moment uh, a majority Labour government led by Corbyn, I mean, absolutely no way it's going to happen. It could, could never happen. The electoral maths are, uh, are totally, totally against it. The only way Corbyn's going to come to power is as, as the head of a broad coalition if he comes to power at all. If we were to fantasise for a minute a majority Labour government under Corbyn, what would it actually do? Um, it, would, um, it would do some things on climate. Uh, it would... Um, uh, be good in terms of things like stopping austerity uh, cuts, um, but it would not give us serious constitutional reform or electoral reform. Uh, it would not go nearly far enough on climate. It would build a new runway probably at, uh, at Gatwick. It might well start coal mining again uh, in South Wales. It would aim at faster growth and the trashing of the environment that goes with it. It would not give us most of what we need. Uh, and. This country and this planet desperately needs real change, change that actually goes far enough, and only we are offering that. So what I'm saying to you is, we have to have a future in which the Green Party continues to grow. And one day, and it has to be a day not too distant in the future, it has to be within the lifetime certainly of most of us in this hall. We need to have a green government. We need to have a government that's led by one of us. We need to have a government that would actually bring in the kinds of changes I've talked about. That would end the fetish for economic growth. That would bring in a land value tax. That would bring in citizens' uh, income. That would bring in monetary reform and all the other things uh, that I've sketched and that uh, we can talk about more uh, in the remainder of, of our time here. That is actually what we need. And we have to keep our eyes fixed on, on that price, distant though it may seem. You've got to imagine just how distant it would have seemed to people in Labour in 1900 to imagine that within a generation they would form a government from no MPs, and they did. We've got uh, one MP, we've made a start. Here in Cambridge, we moved forward in a crucial way at this last election. We gained votes for the general election. Much more crucially than that, we got our foothold on the city council. We have City Councillor sitting right there for us. Um, that was crucial. That's what we have to keep moving forward with. That's what I hope will be a large part of your uh, agenda, if you will, in the back of your minds uh, in, the, in the rest of this evening after we've had uh, our break in, in 20 minutes uh, or so. For, make no mistake, the kinds of changes that Daniel Zeichner would bring in, the kinds of changes that Jeremy Corbyn would bring in, they are, they are not enough by themselves. They are not enough even with us as partners. Ultimately, the, the Green Party is more relevant than ever because we are the party for the 21st uh, century. We are the only ecological party. And that's why ultimately we are the ones who need to take power. Thank you.